Welcome to Vote Chat, brought to you by the Department of Politics at Otago University. I'm Del Carlini. Uh, we're here before a live audience today and we're also live streaming. So welcome to everybody uh, who's uh, tuning in. Um, uh, as always, you can put your questions and we encourage you to put your questions via Twitter uh, to our guests today. And uh, here's Nicole to explain how you can do that. Thanks, Del. So as usual, for those of you in our live audience or watching us on the live stream, you have the opportunity to ask our guest a question. To do this, log into Twitter, form your question and direct it to our Twitter handle, at OUVoteChat. Alternatively, you can use the hashtag VoteChat14. Our guest today is Green Party MP Mojo Mathers. Mojo is a specialist in the areas of disability services, environmental policy and animal welfare, so I welcome your questions about these issues. I'll now hand you back to Dell, who will check in with us here at the Twitter desk later in the show. Thanks, Nicole. We are speaking with um, Mojo Mathis, Mathis today, and I'm told that's exactly the right pronunciation, Mathis. Um, Mojo is the uh, Green Party spokesperson on animal welfare, on disability issues, and on food. Uh, she is the uh, sitting MP, uh, a list MP, and she's number nine on the list uh, for the Green Party. She is sitting uh, in the Christchurch East electorate uh, for this election. And we welcome you here today, Mojo. Hi. Where did the name Mojo come from? Well, um, my parents gave it to me um, after the song by Muddy Waters, um, Got My Mojo Working. Got My Mojo Working, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and has it got your mojo working? You're in Parliament. Very much so, <laughs> yes. All right, so you have a first class degree, uh, honours degree in mathematics. Yep. You have a master's degree in conservation forestry. You're a mother of three. That's right. You have been a parliamentary advisor around water issues and those sorts of things. You've been, had your own forestry, uh, conservation forestry block. And now you find yourself as an MP in parliament. Can you just tell us what that journey was? How did you get into Parliament. What's, what was that process? Well, um, prior to 2000, um, I had very little understanding about politics. Um, but in 2000, I moved with my family out to the country to Colgate, and, um, which is about and I would drive out of Christchurch amongst the foothills there and we were going to have um, a, a lifestyle block and you know live the good life with chickens and sheep and that sort of thing and uh, almost immediately got involved with the local battle to protect the local valley from being used as a, a dam for water for more irrigation on the Canterbury Plains and more dairy cows. And so I became a, one of the co-secretaries of the Dam Action Group and became very active um, to protect water in the uh, local um, community. And as a result of that activism, as a result of being um, passionate about the environment, I joined the Green Party and then they asked me to stand as a candidate in the 2005 general election. So now that's a pretty big challenge. You are the first MP in New Zealand to be profoundly deaf. And I think you said five in the world, is that That's right? right. So therefore, for venturing into Parliament, for you would have had uh, additional uh, issues to deal with when you were doing that. How did you, your thought process go when you were considering whether it was an option for you to, to, to run for Parliament? Well, my motivation when I first stood, um, I wasn't thinking about disability issues. I wasn't thinking about being that being deaf was a barrier. I'd already achieved, um, I felt, being a strong voice for the environment. And um, so that was what drove me. And then I found that there were barriers. I had to find new ways of doing everything, of dealing with the media, um, of, of um, asking um, journalists to contact me by email rather than phoning me, and that sort of thing. And I had to find ways of getting around because but I really wanted to do that. And um, so, but once I was elected, it was like, 
Oh my goodness, um, because of course I needed um, electronic note taking to record the debate that's in Parliament because Parliament television is not captain, so um, deaf New Zealanders throughout cannot follow the Parliament debate. And uh, so I said, well, because Parliament is not accessible and we have a right to be represented and to follow the debate, can you please provide note takers? And, and that resulted in a big public debate around who should fund the note takers, and whether that should come out of the individual MP's budget allocation or whether that was a collective responsibility for the whole of Parliament to be a, provide that service to be accessible for everyone. That's right. So the Lockwood Smith was the Speaker of the House at that time? Yes. And there was a bit of to and fro, backwards and forwards? A lot, yes. What was it like on the inside of that debate? Hmm? Oh, it was very much, very overwhelming. I mean, I've just been elected. All the other MPs were still having to find their way about how Parliament worked. And I was in the centre of the media storm all around me. And it was just like, I just had to be really, really focused and just keep saying what I believe was the right thing to do. And then you gathered support? Winston Peters came in and said... Uh, yeah, it was an amazing amount of support. Um, I think people really got it, that this wasn't about me, it was about inclusion, it was about the right of the deaf and disabled people to be directly represented in Parliament, um, it was about what kind of a future, what did a, a representative Parliament look like, all of these sort of issues. OK, so I want to talk a bit about disability issues, but before we do, you talked about the initial process of whether it be involvement or activism that got you involved in the, power, in the process of politics around um, uh, the, the potential to build a dam in the area that you were living. So you're very interested in water issues. Now, was, can you just describe to us where the Green Party and you are, are moving in this area of water control? Because it has big implications in terms of dairy industry and others. So just, just articulate for us where well, water's going. Well, I think the fundamental principle here is that our rivers and waterways should be clean, that we should not pollute our rivers, and that our rivers should be able to swim in, be clean enough to be, be able to swim in. Um, this is where we holiday, this is where our children go and bathe in, and, and the, we believe that government has a responsibility to set, set high standards for our waterways, for our rivers, so that they are kept clean and that pollution does not enter the waterways. And of course, a major source of pollution is dairying and is um, beef cattle and so on. And we need to fence them out of our waterways so that they're not polluting them. So what's required? What, what do you think the dairy industry should we be doing? We need strong national standards and the, the um, national government has said it's sufficient just to have standards that um, is safe for boating, which means that um, um, the water is only suitable for very brief skin contact. But actually, if you were to get into the water, you would be at risk of serious skin infections or worse. And we say that's not OK. They need to be safe for swimming, um, not just for boating. So we would set higher, stronger national standards for our fresh water. So the dairy industry would be saying, and they are saying, the, you know, there's an enormous amount of money being spent on trying to improve the water, uh, the outflows from dairy farms. That it is, we already have a reasonable standard, but you're saying absolutely that's not the case. That there is a good standard of water. They've, they've talked about doing it voluntary for many, many years now, and it's totally inadequate. We have something like 50% of our monitored swimming sites are not suitable, are not clean enough. They're too polluted to swim in. That's not okay. And we don't want. To, we want to clean these up. We want all of our rivers um, to be safe enough to swim in. And that is going to require some strong um, regulation from central government and standards set. And I mean, the reality is, is that the dairy industry has been making a huge amount of money, um, but it's been doing so at a heavy cost to the environment, um, and we, that's not OK. Now, you're from Christchurch. You're, you're contesting the Christchurch East electorate. You, w you were in the earthquakes that happened in Christchurch. You experienced that yourself. 
What was um, that like? Yes, very much so. I was um, living with my daughter in Overnyside, very near Overnyside Girls High School, where my eldest daughter was attending, and our house that we were renting was um, completely wrecked in the earthquake. Um, so we immediately had to um, move into my mother, uh, mother's house and camp in her land. And um, uh, because the house had to be abandoned immediately and it was quite unsafe. Um, all our stuff was burgled and, oh. as, as well. Um, so it was quite a traumatic time actually. And, um, and then during the second major earthquake, um, I was at my mother's place which was very close to the epicentre and it was absolutely terrifying. Both of my daughters were um, you know, out in town and um, it took hours to find out where they were and whether they were safe or not. Um, it's something that you never forget. So Christchurch East electorate, they're, they're still feeling the effects very strongly of the, of the earthquake in terms of all of the process of the rebuild. What's your platforms in terms of this election campaign? Well, I mean, in, in terms of Christchurch, I mean, we love Christchurch. We want to see a better deal for Christchurch. We want the rebuild of the city to be um, uh, sustainable and to meet the needs of the people of Christchurch. Um, at the moment, um, you know, there's just so much that need to be done and there's so much um, um, being um, dictated to from the central government uh, that is not responsive to the needs of the people of Christchurch. We have a housing crisis, crisis in um, Christchurch. Um, the transport is um, completely, um, um, you know, the roads are very broken and the public transport system is not working effectively for the people of Christchurch. And so we believe there needs to be much more direction and um, much more responsive to the people of Christchurch. They need, their needs need to come first. OK. Now, another area that you're responsible for is around food. Mm. And, and so what does that mean? What, are we talking food security? Are we talking food quality? What, what does that mean on the Green well, Party platform? Well, look, I mean, food is fundamental, obviously. And at the moment, we have a situation where one in four kids in New Zealand are living in poverty. And some of these the families are then unable to provide food for their kids' lunchboxes. Um, so that's not OK. That's not the New Zealand that we love. We need to be ensuring that every kid can thrive. It means there has to be sufficient income going into every household so that they can provide warm, dry housing, that they can provide food in their kids' lunch boxes and these sort of things. So we have a very strong focus on um, policies that will support families, that will support children to thrive. And that might include things like um, we're committed to like in immediately increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour and then progressively increasing it to 66 percent of the average wage. These sort of measures will help put more um, money into the household and then therefore they'll be able to afford the food to keep their children and their families healthy. So it's a social justice platform more than a food quality platform. Is that right? So it's about social justice. Absolutely. In terms it's of the about having a fairer society. Um, and, you know, I mean, we love New Zealand, and in New Zealand that we love isn't going to be leaving one in four children in poverty. That's not OK. We will need to do something about it. OK. Let's turn to disabilities for a second. You've become a bit of a rock star amongst the disability sector in New Zealand in the sense that there's people, as I look at, on, on you, you know, YouTube and I look at the, throughout the, the web, there's a lot of people delighted that they appear to have a representative in Parliament, across, all across disabilities. What, just give us the picture of disability in this country. Is it who's disabled? Uh, how, how many people are we talking about? How big an issue is it for people? It's a massive issue in New Zealand. The latest census says that nearly one in four New Zealanders have a disability that um, affects um, their ability to participate in society. Um, and uh, um, what I've found since I've been elected and being a, a bit of a public figure is that it's about 
participation. It's about being able to participate and contribute to society on an equal basis with everyone else. It's about being valued and our skills and our abilities being recognised instead of people focusing on what we can't do. And um, New Zealand government has signed the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that convention acknowledges and recognises that we have the same right to participate and contribute to society as anyone else. And that means that the barrier to participation needs to be removed so that it is possible, for example, to enter buildings that were not being locked out of buildings, that were not being locked out of access to information. Um, you know, for, for me personally, a major one is captaining. Um, there's so many um, television programmes um, that I don't have captain, so I can't follow the, the political debate or the news that's on television. So um, Campbell Live, for example, is not captained, and yet so many political stories are covered on Campbell Live, and I have to work out what what the conversation is from what other people are saying about it, but I can't go and watch it and watch for myself. And there's so many other New Zealanders in a very similar situation. So, um, yeah, well, employment is a big one for us as well, because um, even if we're very highly skilled and qualified, like for example, my, I have, as you've mentioned, several degrees, um, it was still really, really challenging to get a job um, with a research organisation, because the first thing they would say to me is, can you use the telephone? We're not interested in employing you because you won't be able to talk to our clients on the telephone. And um, uh, these sort of attitudes that are really real barrier to um, entering employment for disabled people. I want to follow that further, but we've got a question on Twitter. Um, Nicole. Yes, so given that it is Māori Language Week, we have a very relevant question come through from Vote Left 14, who are asking about the role of sign and Māori language in our schools. Um, it's incredibly important that schools offer sign language and Māori. Um, we need to celebrate um, the diversity of language. I mean, sign is a beautiful language. Young people in particular really love sign and they get really excited about it. And they can use it themselves in um, situations like a noisy pub or so on. And it's a visual language. And so I think that we should celebrate our diversity as a country and that we should um, all be able to have some conversational sign. Um, it was just something that would really help both the deaf community, but actually it's very enjoyable for everyone else. So what would have to happen to get that, that sign language? Because it's one of our three official languages. That's right. So what would have to happen to, to put start the process of getting sign language taught in our school? Is that what it is, being taught in our schools or...? Well, it's already happening. There is already um, many um, schools that participate in Sign Language Week and there are resources that go out from Deaf Aotearoa, which is the national organisation um, for deaf, and um, to provide schools with the resources to um, teach a bit of sign in the classroom and for them to participate in sign language week. And that actually was how I got involved with the deaf community myself, because of through my own children um, being taught sign at primary school. And what happened was that they came home and to me and said, Mum, do you know any sign? And it's so cool. And I went, oh, no, I don't. I think I must find out more about it. Because although I'm profoundly deaf, I was brought up oral, and, I were, and the school that I attended, which was the School for Deaf in England, didn't allow sign language. It was banned in the school. Um, uh, uh, you got a big black mark if you used sign language. So just like Maori for a while were denied the right to their own language, the deaf community were denied the right to use sign language. And so I've had to learn sign language much later on in life. And it's been a very, very valuable tool for me because there are many situations where um, I cannot hear what's going on and a sign language interpreter can provide a very valuable means of access. Now, the interesting thing there is I saw you on the, the comedy programme Seven Days. Yeah. And I thought at the time, that's a very gutsy move 
to go on there because you would never know what they're about to say, those guys, would they? How was that experience? Oh, well, it's uh, absolutely crazy um, because, of course, Seven Days is not captain. So I'd never walked seven days. So I didn't really know what to expect. And uh, I was just told not to take it too seriously. <laughs> and I pretty much was flown straight up. Uh, they did my makeup and shoved me in. And I just had to sort of go with the flow. And to be honest, quite a bit of that time, I was guessing what they were saying. I was just um, having to sort of just go by gut feel. I think sometimes a lot of people guess what they're saying on that program. So let's go back because because you were touching on employment and you were saying the difficulties that people face. So how do you overcome that? How, is that through legislation? Is it change? Is it equipment? How do you get more deaf or uh, people with other disabilities in employment? It's a key issue for you, isn't it? Yes, it definitely is because access to employment and access to a better income is mainly um, that... Um, you know, we have a better standard of living and so on. So it's fundamental for better outcomes for deaf and disabled people. Um, so in order to get bring about better employment um, opportunities, uh, the, all of these measures that you mentioned, attitude, um, um, a support for equipment, um, education, all of these things are, are going to be really, really important. Um, so we already have... Um, uh, support organisations that like work with employers to educate employers about the opportunities that they are locking themselves out of by not employing disability and um, disabled people. And uh, we need more of that because very often it's just about making some reasonable accommodations, just tweaking the job description a wee bit, um, maybe allowing slightly flexible hours um, or um, you know, not requiring a driver's licence if the bulk of the job doesn't require any driving because as soon as you require a driver's licence you lock a lot of pe de disabled people out of being able to even apply for a job. Um, so there's a lot of really quite small things that uh, would make a big difference. So there's an attitudinal change but there, are you saying there's more legislation required? Is that part of your drive? Well, there, 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 there is need, a need for the government to um, currently provide job support funding for the group of um, proposal of disabled people that require access to um, some support funds in order to maybe provide sign language interpretation or um, note takers or specialised equipment. Um, so there are some public funding available, but it's not enough. We need more. Um, and the criteria about who can access these are too tight. They need to be opened up so that um, it's available for more dis disabled people to access. OK. In the lives of disabled people, one of the key issues that's being debated out there is this difference between how people became disabled and if those who dis became disabled through accident come under ACC, mm. those who became disabled through illness or you know, multiple sclerosis, sclerosis or, or cancer or whatever, they come under a different funding regime, which is a lot less. So that's I could right. get in a car, I could get in a car, dr get drunk, drive into a tree and become disabled and I would have full coverage. Other people who had an illness uh, are funded at a much lower level. I know within the dis disability sector this is a, this is a big issue. Uh, is there policy for, from a green point of view to, to address that? I'd, I'd... Absolutely, it's a massive um, um, issue. Um, basically, the core principle out here is fairness and the right to access the support that you need to participate in society, regardless of the cause of the disability. So whether you were born with a disability, um, whether you acquired it through illness or whether you acquired it through an accident, um, everyone should be able to access the support that they need to participate and um, access services and so on. Um, so that's the fundamental platform that we need to be starting from, um, not creating this sort of artificial distinction between who can and who can't access support on the basis of how you acquired the disability. Um, and I mean, it's uh, very important in the area of hearing loss. Um, so for a long time, there was 
very lot of support from the available to put to the hearing aid, um, uh, even if you were profoundly deaf and really needed these hearing aids just to participate in society, as opposed to someone who had, might have a slight noise-related illness. Um, the, the point here is that everyone should get the support that they're entitled to. Now, the counter to that argument is that it's going to be very expensive to move a lot of people into the ACC process. I know that the government is very uh, cautious about what it does around ACC, so there'd be an added cost. You're saying there's a, there's a social equity you have, argument. You have to look at the cost of not inc including people. Okay? The cost of exclusion is very high. Uh, because when people can't participate, when people can't access the services they need, um, it impacts it on their health, it impacts on their mental well-being, and also it means that society is not taking advantage of the skills that they have to offer, and so they're not um, they're contributing economically to the full extent in the whole of society. So there's a lot of counter-arguments that say, actually, um, from an economic perspective, we, must, we should not be locking out a whole segment of society from contributing and participating. So you've become a lightning rod for, yeah. because you're there in Parliament. You have the ability to, to work within that system. And what are they asking for? What's the, what's the fundamental thing? Is it, is it more money for projects? Is it, what, are, what are people, individuals, asking for? Disabled people, hmm. what disabled people are asking for. They're asking for respect. They're asking to be able to be included. And, and they're asking for um, the right to be acknowledged. All right, let's now look at one of the other areas of, of your portfolio, if you like, and that's uh, animal welfare. Now this is a this is a big issue for you, and it's and you've been quite active in this area lately. What's the fundamentals for you, you, you in terms of the way you're approaching your campaigns around animal welfare? What what are the what's the key issue for you around animal welfare in this country? Well, basically, um, animals we love animals, and we believe they have the right to a humane life. Um, and the right to express the um, natural behaviour and, and not to be subject to pain, to abuse, to cruelty, all of these things. And um, at the moment, um, the two main areas where um, animals are really suffering in New Zealand. Um, the first area is in animal testing and the second area is in factory farming. And so I've been working on both of these areas. Um, I led the political um, in Parliament, the big debate around whether we should be testing psychoactive drugs on animals. And I was the one who brought that to the Sunday Star Times and then um, submitted an amendment to the psychoactive substances bill to um, exclude the use of information from animal testing of these drugs um, being used to assess their safety. And at first, National rejected that amendment, but a year later, they decided to accept that. In so, so th that brings us to a point. You're sitting in with the Greens, in the Greens caucus, but in order to get a lot of the, your issues, you've got to be w talking to people across all parties, haven't you? Are, is that something that you have a strength in? Is that something th that people are willing to listen to you from the position oh, of the Greens? Oh, I've had conversations with um, um, people across the whole range of political um, groupings in Parliament. Um, I do a lot of work on the select committees when the bill is appear before a select committee and their, their um, level of uh, cooperation and understanding of what's needed to be able for me to be able to participate is very high. I mean, it's just the fact that I'm in there, in, in the system, is create, raising the level of awareness about disability amongst all of the MPs that are often casually talk to me about, ah, oh, you know, um, can I have a look at your note taking to see what, how well they're transcribing um, and, you know, being prepared to be flexible with how they do things. So, like, initially they would run the vote too quickly for me to be able to of my vote and I say, well, uh, I've missed the vote, it, uh, my note taker can't keep up and then they would redo it and slow it down so that I could engage and participate. It's been fantastic. Right. So then let's look at the cosmetic issue for animals. Mm. What's the, what's the, my understanding is that there isn't much testing or isn't any testing at all on 
uh, on, in animals within New Zealand for cosmetics, and yet there's a big push to get this uh, uh, change in legislation. Explain that to me. Okay. Well, MPI say that there's no testing of cosmetics Ministry in Ministry of Zealand. Primary Industries, That's MPI. It, uh, the Ministry of Primary Industries. So their advice, their officers say there's no testing of cosmetics. So if that's right, then this is the perfect time to bring in a ban on the testing of the testing of cosmetics and animals because then the issue won't arise in the future and we've established um, that it's not allowed in New Zealand and we'll have sent a clear message worldwide that we don't think it's okay. Um, in fact, they've uh, been so resistant to adopting this that, uh, um, the, and the test that are used for cosmetics are available in New Zealand. They just say it for something else, for some other purpose, but it's the same testing um, that's done on um, cosmetic safety. So uh, we've had a lot of discussion around um, what does the, uh, a ban on cosmetics look like without um, adverse um, consequences. But at the end of the day, you know, Country, all 28 countries of the um, European Union have banned the testing of cosmetics and animals. Israel and India and many other countries are, are following suit. So there is a worldwide movement to stop the testing of cosmetics and animals. It's unnecessary, it's painful, and we can, we can do better by animals than this. And the only reason we do all this testing is to try and keep developing another shade of lipstick, another shade of eyeshadow, that sort of thing. And it's just, it's just too trivial. We have thousands of cosmetics available for our use. We do not need to subject animals to this kind of suffering just for vanity. All right. Now, Professor um, Natalie Warren from the University of Edinburgh says that New Zealand's legislation, Animal Welfare Act, is rated as the top animal welfare act in the world, uh, 1999, I think, is that the, the act, and that the British, the UK Act of 2006 was based on the New Zealand one because it was far ahead of others, uh, and other, other countries around the world <coughs> are looking to follow that mm. New Zealand lead. Now, are you agreeing with that? Do you believe the New Zealand welfare, uh, Animal Welfare Act is the right one? I think there are two things here. Firstly, we're falling behind. Many other countries have overtaken us in, in animal welfare issues. It's not just about what's in the law, it's how it's implemented in practice. So, like, you've had the EU um, ban the testing of cosmetics on animals, and not only have they done that, they've also banned the sale of cosmetics that are tested on animals and their ingredients. So um, other countries have basically overtaken New Zealand and we are falling behind. And the other thing, it's not just about what the law says, it's just about how it's enforced and monitored. And basically MPI, the Ministry of Primary Industry, is not doing a good enough job of monitoring and enforcing animal welfare law in New Zealand. And we've seen this recently with the shocking footage that was of um, pig factory pig farming that was on Sunday News. I mean, if you saw that footage, you could not claim that we were world leaders in animal welfare, because we are not. There's no way that fans like that should exist in New Zealand if we are claimed to be world leaders in animal welfare. We, we are not. So, that was Farm Watch and SAFE. How, how connected are you with those two organisations? How what? How connected are you with SAFE? I have conversations with them, yes. And I've, I've, you know, talked with them around factory farming and stuff, and um, I viewed the full footage um, that Bam Watts obtained, um, but it's far more shocking, actually, than what was shown on Sunday News. Because mm. the question I've got is that the press release that you put out was exactly when that programme was to air, which meant that you prepared that press release earlier. So you'd seen the footage beforehand, You'd viewed the footage, so you knew that it was coming. And you knew that, uh, that this activist group had been on people's properties. Is that something you condone? I sat there typing the press release as I was watching the programme. So because I knew it was coming up, they'd been advertised, and I knew pretty much the content of it because they had shown pre, you know, in the Sunday news, um, pre footage. Um, advertising that the programme was coming up, they already knew 
the guts of what we're going to be in there. And I sat there, I, so I drafted the framework and then fine-tuned the press release before I sent out. And absolutely was um, aware of it coming up, no doubt about that. So you're reacting to what you're seeing on screen? I was reacting to the footage that was coming up beforehand, and I also had seen the full footage of what was obtained by FarmWatch as well. OK, so therefore... I, mean, I hadn't seen the Sunday news programme before, but I'd seen the raw you'd, footage. You'd seen the raw footage. Because footage from an organisation such as SAFE, they wanting to put a, they're an activist organisation wanting to put one point of view across. One mm. point of view only. And with film, it's reasonably easy to show one point of view. So do, were you... Did you think through the process of how this Are you saying that it's OK for pigs to be cramped and conditioned like that, with rats crawling over them, and what for the conditioned? Because there was no way they faked that footage. What I'm asking you, as somebody who's interested in rural issues, and this yeah. is a problem for rural people, that people are coming onto other people's property and, and killing animals, a deer, we've seen sheep lately in this part mm. of the world. Uh, to go onto a family farm, are you OK with that? That, that, that people went on there? I think in the situation where MPI is not proactively investigating farms themselves and is not only inspecting factory farms where there is a complaint laid, but the problem is that these animals are behind closed doors, the public cannot see what is going on, and then MPI is only investigating when there's a complaint laid. How is the public to lay a complaint when they can't see what is going on? OK, so the reality is people have lost faith in MPI to be the upholders of animal welfare standards in New Zealand. OK, so um, if we had more trust in MPI that they were going to investigate these farms, that they were going to do on-the-spot on auditing, then you would have a, your point would be fair. But that's not what we've got in New Zealand. We've got a situation where animals are suffering behind locked doors. And there are people who feel it's their moral obligation to expose what is happening and make the public aware that MPI is failing to enforce high animal welfare standards in New Zealand. And the animals are living in squalor and in the most appalling conditions. So what you're wanting is a change within the way that MPI is the regulator, is that right, in terms of how these issues are looked at? Well, basically what the Green Party position is that MPI are not the right body to be monitoring animal welfare in New Zealand. That what we need is an independent commissioner for animal welfare and that they are well resourced and charged with monitoring and enforcing animal welfare in New Zealand. Um, because there is an inherent conflict of interest between MPI and the objective of um, economic, um, increasing economic productivity on the farm and animal welfare on the other hand. So we need an independent body that is absolute focus on the welfare of animals. Right. Now, we've got a question to, on Twitter, I believe, Nicole. Yeah, we've had a question come in asserting that many minority groups feel that their voice isn't being heard and they're disengaged from politics. Do you think this is true of the deaf community? Um, <clears throat> um, it's definitely been the case for um, many deaf and um, disabled people. It's a, um, a sense of frustration, a sense that people are not listening, politicians are not listening to them, and that even just the process of getting their voice heard, there are many barriers in the way. Um, I'm on the Government Admin Select Committee and we've just finished an inquiry into the accessibility of Parliament and basically what we concluded was that Parliament is not accessible and that is everything from the physical premises to accessing the website to being able to make a submission, um, all of these uh, parliamentary processes that the general public can access has many barriers so that disabled people can't even get a foot in the door to have their voice heard. And we've made a, a, a wide range of recommendations for improving the accessibility of Parliament, which is very important for um, the voice of the deaf and disabled people to be heard. OK, so, so accessibility seems to be the recurring issue. Captioning, from your perspective, is a, is a major process. There's, a, there's an academic here at uh, Otago University, Lindley Hood, who uh, promotes very strongly around um, visual impairment. 
the fact that uh, while there's uh, 11,000 people who are legally blind, there's another 95,000 people who are visually impaired but don't come under the, that legislation and don't get the assistance. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the, the whole issue around disabilities are actually uh, uh, you know, quite broad, broad. So you can deal with issues for access, accessibility for some people and it won't be an issue for others. So you've, you've, got, a, you've got a tiger by the tail here when you're talking um, uh, disability issues with the breadth of it, is that right? It's, um, yeah, it covers everything. It covers access to information, physical access, um, access to being able to participate, to education, access to services, all of these different areas. And it will cover things like sensory um, barriers, um, vision, or hearing, um, physical barriers, mental health barriers, all of these different barriers that exist. And um, it is a process of working with the different disability groups, listening to them when they say what the barriers are for them, and then working to how can we dismantle these barriers. OK, we've got a few minutes left. And I just want to just take you through a few of the issues that we've talked about, but saying you've got, a, you've got a term coming up, you're number nine on the list, you've raised in the list, you've gone from 14 to nine. Tell me about that. Is that what does that indicate to you within the Green Party? I think it indicates that people um, have really valued the work that I've done around animal welfare and around disability, and also recognise the fact that I am the only openly disabled person in Parliament, and that I have done pioneering work in Parliament for disabled people, um, pretty, and that, that is incredibly important that their voice is heard in Parliament. So therefore, you've got three years, if you're, you're, you're back in Parliament, which it's looking like you're probably likely to be. You have uh, issues around Christchurch East. Just quickly, what's the, what's the focus for you around Christchurch East? What do you want to achieve in the next three years? In Christchurch East? Yeah. I, would, I would like to see better housing, um, warm, dry, affordable housing for people in Christchurch East. Um, and also schools to be built as um, community hubs for the um, for the citizen to be able to access good quality education. It's fundamental. What do you want to achieve over the next three years in terms of animal welfare? I would like to see a ban on animal testing for cosmetics and I would like to see a ban on the sale of cosmetics and I would like to see a move to banning factory farming. And what would you like to see achieve? You've got three years in, in a term. What would you say you've been successful if you've achieved for the disability sector? I would like to see, uh, oh, I'd like to see um, uh, move to improve employment outcomes for disabled people. I would like to see disabled people have better access to um, information and captioning legislation brought in so that um, we had achieved higher levels of captioning on both broadcast and on demand television. I would like to see um, a change in attitude towards disability, so that disability wasn't seen as a burden, but as something to celebrate as part of us being a diverse society, so that um, people were more positive and more welcoming and inclusive. I think we are seeing some of that change in society, but I think that we've got a long way to go. And has being in Parliament for you been a, a, a positive experience? Um, overall, yes, but it's also been very tiring and adjusting at times because that's the nature of being in Parliament. Right. I think that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you very much. Really thank appreciate you. your time here today. Um, thanks to everyone who was uh, with us today watching Vote Chat. I'd like to thank our uh, researchers who have been involved in putting together the questions uh, uh, to put to our guest, um, Rosa, Zoe and Alex. I'd also like to say that there's, after this today, there is a, uh, a panel discussion by the Coalition for Better Broadcasting and here that people are welcome to tune into. That's at three o'clock. Um, next week, we have uh, Lila Hare from the uh, Internet Party here and Peter Grace will be here interviewing Lila Hare. So I hope that you join us then uh, and uh, continue to participate in vote chat uh, leading up to the election. Thanks very much.